discussion of Fourier series. Today we will take up considerations of power and related aspects associated with a periodic signal. You recall that the Fourier series expansion of a periodic f of t can be put in this form in its exponential representation. To start with, let us try to calculate the RMS value of this periodic signal in terms of the Fourier coefficient Cn in its exponential representation. So we would like to calculate the RMS value of f of t. We can do this in time domain as the average of the mean square of f, f t. But we would like to carry out this analysis in terms of the complex coefficient C n. Let us see how we do it. Suppose I would like to calculate f squared of t. Then this can be written as C n e to the power of j n omega naught t n of course ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity multiplied by the same series but in order to facilitate our taking stock of the various terms I would like the index here to be m instead of n. m from 1 to minus infinity to plus infinity. This of course can be written as summed on m from minus infinity to plus infinity and summation on m from minus infinity to plus infinity. So each term here gets multiplied by uh, each one of these terms on the second summation. So, I have C n multiplied by C m e to the power of j m plus n omega naught t. Now, in order to find out the mean value of this f square t, we should find out the average of this whole series. So, the average of the summation is really the summation of the averages. So, we would like to find out the average of each one of these terms. If we do that, then we can sum up those averages and say that is indeed the average of f square t because the RMS value of f of t is the square root of the mean of the square. Let us see the average value of C m C m e to the power of j m plus n omega naught t, what is it going to be? When we are talking about the average, we always understand that it is the average over a full cycle, the complete period of the fundamental. So, 
this is the only time dependent term cm and cm are constant so what do we have if m plus n is an integer then e to the power of so j k omega naught t if you integrate over a complete period it's going to vanish because it is after all cos m plus n omega naught t plus j sin m plus n omega naught t any sine term and cosine term integrated over a complete period or an integral number of periods is going to be zero therefore the average of this will be zero if m plus n is not equal to zero so if m plus n is some non zero constant an integer that's going to be zero on the other hand suppose we have a case if m equals minus n or m plus n is zero if m plus n is zero then this whole term becomes one and the average of cn cm is cn cm itself therefore the average of that would be cm multiplied by cm and what is m m equals minus n when m plus n is zero m equals minus n therefore cn multiplied by c minus n and since we know that cn and c minus n are complex conjugates of each other we are multiplying a complex number by its conjugate the result is simply the magnitude cn whole square so we have that the average of each one of these terms here will be either zero or an expression like cn square therefore we can now come to the conclusion that the average of f square t the average of this term is the sum of the averages of this now let us see what happens if i freeze a particular value of n and allow the m to take increments from minus infinity to plus infinity so m goes on changing from minus infinity to plus infinity when m takes minus n then you have a non zero average for all other values of m the contribution is zero so when you take a particular value of m in the first summation m equals minus n is the only term which gives some contribution non zero contribution and that we do for all values of m so the result is this will be n from minus infinity to plus infinity for each value of n the contribution can come only when m equals minus n and under that condition the contribution is cn squared therefore this will be cn magnitude squared and what is the average of f square t it is rms value of the periodic function squared square of the rms value mean square value therefore if i write this as f rms or the effective value of this one that is equal to cn magnitude square n ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity you can see this can also be written as c not squared or i will put it as a not squared because i like to put this in the terms of the coefficients of the trigonometric series so when n equal 0 c n equal c not that is a not squared and c n squared and c minus n squared together are both equal to each other therefore this will be two times c n squared will turn out turn out to be a n squared plus b n squared over 2 n ranging from 1 to infinity because a n squared plus b n squared is 4 4 c n squared because square root of a n squared plus b n squared is 2 c n as you recall therefore a n squared plus b n squared is 4 c n squared 4 c n squared upon 2 d c c n squared and n equals k and n equals minus k together contribute one c n term will come for positive n another for negative n together they constitute a n squared plus b n squared over 2 
So what do we find? That the RMS value of a composite wave periodic wave, the square of that equals the square of the DC term and an squared plus bn squared. Root of an squared plus bn squared cos n omega naught t plus pn as you recall is the nth harmonic. So what we have here is the peak value squared divided by 2 which means this RMS value is the nth harmonic squared. Root of an squared plus bn squared over root 2 is the RMS value of the nth harmonic therefore is RMS value of the nth harmonic squared. An r squared is the dc squared. So the final conclusion is the RMS value of a periodic wave the square of that equals the summation of or I can say the sum of the RMS value square of the harmonic complex. Sum of squares of RMS values of harmonic components including the DC. So that is an easy way to remembering how you can calculate the RMS value of periodic wave once you have got the Fourier series analysis for that. This of course is also equal to 1 over T naught. This is also equal in time domain 1 over T naught r square T dt over a period. So you can calculate the RMS value either in time domain or in terms of the harmonic components whichever is convenient to you at a particular context, in a particular context. Now let us continue this and see uh, as far as f of t is concerned it could be a voltage signal, it could be a current signal. So we can calculate the RMS value for a voltage signal or a current signal using this kind of formulation. Now let us see how we calculate power when we are given two periodic signals, one being a voltage, the other a current. Let us assume that we have a network or a network element which has a periodic voltage applied across it and a periodic current IT going to the terminals. Now let the voltage V of T be V0 plus Vn cos n omega naught plus alpha n, n ranging from 1 to infinity. So that is the Fourier series expansion for the voltage wave which is periodic with a fundamental frequency omega naught. This is the amplitude of the nth harmonic and this is the DC term. And li likewise let the current wave form be I naught plus n from 1 to infinity of I n cosine n omega naught t plus beta n. Now the instantaneous power P of t is of course the product of B of t and I of t. And when we talk about power associated with any periodic phenomenon, we always imply the average power over a fundamental period or an integral multiple of such periods. Therefore, when we say power associated with this voltage and current, that is the power input into this network N, this we simply call this P, it is the average of the product of V of T times I of t. Always the average is over a complete period. So we take these two series and multiply them out. 
So, you have the average of v naught plus v n cos n omega naught t plus alpha n multiplied by i naught plus i n cos n omega naught t plus beta i. Now, when you look at this, you have a whole lot of terms here, but luckily for us, we are interested in only the average of these terms, the sum of these terms. So, you notice that V naught gets multiplied with I naught, get multiplied with I n cos omega naught t plus beta 1, I 2 cos 2 omega naught t plus beta 2 and so on, but when we are talking about average, it is only this V naught I naught which results in a non-zero average, V naught multiplied by I 1 cos omega naught t plus beta 1 is 0, V naught multiplied by I 2 cos 2 omega 2 t plus beta 2 is 0 and so on and so forth. So, as far as the V naught is concerned, the contribution to the average will come from the term V naught I naught. Similarly, when you take the fundamental here, V 1 cos omega naught t plus alpha 1, that multiplied by I naught will be, you have a zero average. V 1 cos omega naught t plus alpha n multiplied by I 1 cos omega naught t plus beta 1 will have an average. After all, it is a voltage and current at the same frequency. That the average will be of course, be a product of V 1 and I 1 divided by 2, the product of the two RMS values times the cosine of the phase angle between alpha and beta, alpha 1 minus beta 1. All other terms, the fundamental here multiplied by the second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic will have zero average. So, consequently, P will turn out to be V naught I naught, that is the product of the DC terms. The nth harmonic terms will be V n I n divided by 2 cos alpha n minus beta n. This is the power factor associated with the nth harmonic component n ranging from 1 to n. So, this is the DC power. This is the power associated with nth harmonic. So, when you have non-periodic, uh, when you have periodic waveforms which are non-sinusoidal, and if you make the Fourier series expansions of Vt and It, as far as the power is concerned, the average power is concerned, you can calculate the power for each frequency separately. The product of V naught and I naught is the DC power, the nth harmonic power is calculated taking the nth harmonic voltage component, the nth harmonic current component, multiplying their RMS values times cosine or the phase angle difference between them. As a rule, power is a a nonlinear quantity associated with the voltage and current, nonlinear function of voltages and currents. However, in the particular case where the components are of different frequencies, you can calculate, superpose the power for each component separately as we have seen here. Normally, if you have a voltage V as the sum of V1 plus V2 and the currents I1 plus I2, you can't say V1 I1 plus V2 I2 is the power because you can't it does not work out that way. But as long as you are calculating the power associated with a pair of currents and voltage components at different frequencies, then the summation will be valid and this is what we are having here. You can superpose power therefore, if you calculate the power associated with each set of pair of frequency components, current and voltage, you can do that. Also, if you have the same frequency, suppose you have you have V, let us say, V A cos omega naught T plus V B sin omega naught T and current let us say is I A cos omega naught T and I B sin omega naught T. Then associated with this, you can say power is V A I A divided by 2 
plus VB IB divided by 2. Here also you have some superposition principle is working out, will work out. That is because there is a 90 degrees phase difference between this component of the voltage and the other component of the voltage. Here also there is a 90 degrees difference between this current and this current. So the associated, the components associated with the cos omega naught t terms can be multiplied together and the components associated with sin omega naught t may be multiplied together and they can be superposed. So power can be superposed under these conditions. If we have components at the same frequency but with 90 degrees phase difference, you can superpose the two components of power or as in this case, if we have got different frequency components, you can calculate power separately for each one of these components. That is why we can always term these quantities as the fundamental DC power, fundamental power, second harmonic power, third harmonic power and so on and each harmonic power can be calculated independently of the values of voltage and currents at the other harmonics. Let us take an example. Suppose I have a 10 volt signal, a voltage, an offset square wave with a period T naught and this voltage signal is given to an RL circuit R equals 1 ohm and L is such that omega naught L is 1 ohm. we have naturally a current I of t. The question that will be asked is find I RMS and the power under steady state. So this is the question that has been asked. What we propose to do is we split up the given input voltage V of t into its various harmonic components. Under the influence of each harmonic component of the voltage, we will calculate the current under steady state. So we get expressions for V of t and I of t in the form of Fourier series and once we have them, it is easy to calculate I RMS and the overall power in the manner that we have illustrated earlier. So V of t is 10 times a DC component, the average value of this periodic wave is 5 volts, therefore that is a DC value and once you remove the DC value, you have the familiar square wave that you have been talking about so often in the past. So it will have a Fourier series expansion of 4 times this amplitude divided by n pi and you have only odd harmonic terms present and sign terms only will be present because once you remove the DC term, this will turn out to be an odd function of time. Anyway, the final Fourier series would be sin n omega naught t and n from 1 to infinity and n odd because this has, once you remove the DC term, this will have <coughs> odd uh, half wave symmetry. So you have V of t and now we do the steady state analysis of the circuit and to do that we need to find out the impedance of the circuit for different frequencies. So Z J n omega naught. So for the nth harmonic frequency the impedance of the circuit is R plus J n omega naught L and since R equals 1 ohm and omega naught L is 1 ohm, this is Jn, so many ohms. 
So we have the impedance for different frequencies, we have the voltage. So under steady conditions, under steady state, I of t will be for each component separately we find the steady state current. If we have a DC voltage of 5 volts in a circuit consisting of R and L, the current will be V divided by R. Five, so 5 upon 1 that is 5. And the nth harmonic component, the voltage is 20 upon n pi. So the peak value of the current will be divided by this voltage divided by the value of the impedance which is square root of 1 plus n squared sin n omega naught t since the impedance has an angle tan inverse of l therefore there will be a phase difference between the current between the voltage and the current this will be tan inverse of R tangent of L. So we have the complete description of the voltage and current in terms of the Fourier components. So we can calculate the whatever results that are required I R M S and P under steady state conditions. First of all, let us also calculate VRMS just for sake of interest. So VRMS squared will be the square of the DC term phi squared plus the fundamental amplitude square divided by 2 because we have to take the RMS value of the fundamental, RMS value of the fundamental is 20 upon root 2 pi. Where the third harmonic component 20 upon 3 root 2 pi all square etc etc etc. And if you calculate this, this will turn out to be 25 200 upon pi square times 1 plus 1 by 3 square plus 1 by 5 squared etc etc and this series is known to have a res, uh, summation equal to pi squared upon 8 therefore this will turn out to be 25 plus 200 upon pi squared into pi squared upon 8 so this is total 50 watts so VRMS equals 7.07 I am sorry 50 that is volts. The result which would have obtained straight away from here working out in time domain it is quite simple once there is a peak value of 10 volts you integrate this out and you get this result straight away. But it just I wanted to demonstrate the use of this formula for RMS value terms of Vt that is how we got this we could have got this same result working out in time domain straight away. But it is not so you could not have got this in time domain so easily for I of the I RMS because the once you have this type of voltage the current under steady state would have a characteristic like this under steady state that will be the value how the current will vary. So you must if you wanted to find the RMS value of the current you would have to find out the expression for I of t in this manner so that the starting point is equal to the same at the end of the period it will fit the initial conditions suitably and then do the integration. But now we have got the term the expression for I of t in the form of Fourier series. We can calculate I RMS in terms of its various harmonic components. So phi squared the DC term plus summation 20 upon root 2 n pi root of 1 minus n squared whole squared because this is the peak amplitude the RMS value will be obtained by dividing by root 2 and then n from 1 to infinity n odd. You calculate the first few terms you will get 25 from the fundamental from the DC from the fundamental you get 10.13 
for the third harmonic you get 0.23 for the fifth harmonic you get 0.03 and therefore afterwards it will be negligible. So the this will be equal to 35.39 and I RMS will be 5.95 amperes. <coughs> what about power? We have V of T and I of T here. So power we can calculate taking a particular term here and the associated current terminal the current term here and finding out the phase angle. So let us see the DC power P naught. Product of these two the DC voltage and the DC component the current 25 watts. Fundamental power. Fundamental power we have the amplitude of the fundamental voltage is 20 upon pi. The amplitude of the fundamental component of the current is 20 upon pi n equals 1 square root of 2 and of course n is equal to 1. These are the product of the amplitudes. So multiplied by half because we want to take the product of the RMS values and cosine of the phase angle difference tan inverse of 1 that is equal to pi by 4, so cos pi by 4. And this turns out to be 10.13 watts. Similarly, T3 will be given by half of 20 upon 3 pi. multiplied by 20 upon 3 pi when n substitute m equals 3 this is root 10 cosine of whatever angle you get for tan inverse of 3 and this will turn out to be 0.23 watts. The total power if you assume that all other harmonic component powers are negligible, P0 plus P1 plus P3 will be 35.4 watts. So that will be total power that will be delivered by the source into the circuit. If you look at this closely, you will find that once you have got the RMS value, you could have calculated the power without going to this analysis. After all, you know the RMS value of the current in the circuit. So if you know the RMS value of the current in the circuit, the RMS value squared multiplied by resistance will be the total power in the circuit. So indeed it turns out that I RMS squared is 35.39 and the power that we got also is the same thing, 35.4 watts. But it only illustrates the procedure, the principle that is involved. That is, you can calculate the powers for different harmonic components separately and add them up to get the total power in the circuit. The last example showed that the size of the various harmonic components and the powers associated with the harmonics go down as the order of the harmonic in increases. So we should like to see how fast these various coefficients go down and that is related to what is meant by convergence of the Fourier series. So we should look at the convergence, we should like to look at the convergence properties of the Fourier series. So first let us consider this particular point. Suppose f of t is approximated by the Fourier series up to order capital N. That means we have C0 plus 2Cn cos n omega naught t plus Tn 
Now, if you take m from 0 to 1 to infinity, that constitutes the entire Fourier series. But now, suppose I truncate the series at capital M. So, this is the approximated Fourier series. We take only a finite number of turns. And the difference between the actual f of t and the truncated Fourier series, we will call that the error E of t. So, this error now depends upon the value m that we take. Now, if you take the square of the error, integrate this from 0 to t naught and take its average, then this is referred to as the mean squared error, mean square error. So, the square of the mean, the mean of the square of the error, this is called the mean square error. So, we will see that this decreases with the capital N that value of N that you take. Closely related to this and actually this expression is equivalent to another term like this. Suppose you take the RMS value of the given waveform and its square, FRMS square. Assuming that F of t is a voltage signal, this represents the square of the RMS value of the voltage signal. And if this voltage is applied to a 1 ohm resistor, this is the power that is dissipated in that 1 ohm resistor. Therefore, if this is a voltage signal, F RMS squared can also be thought of as the power available from the signal. However, if you take only the sum of the RMS values of the various harmonic components up to n, that means you take C naught squared plus n from 1 to capital N to C n magnitude squared, 2 C n magnitude squared is the sum of the squares of the RMS values of the harmonic components from 1 to n because after all 2 C n equals square root of A n squared plus B n squared. Therefore, 4 C n squared is A n squared plus B n squared and RMS value is A n squared plus B n squared upon 2. Therefore, 2 C n magnitude squared is the square of the RMS value of the nth harmonic component and therefore, the difference this is the power available from the signal. This is the sum of the powers available from the various harmonic components up to order n. So, this quantity can be shown to be equal to the other quantity which we had written earlier. Both these will monotonically decrease with n. So, the larger the value of n you take, the less will be the discrepancy, the less will be the error and the decrease is monotonic and as you take larger and larger values of n, these terms go down. So, the next question that we would like to ask is, how fast do these CN terms decrease with n? So, that is the next property of interest that we would like to know. So, the question that we would ask is, how fast do C n terms, the coefficients, C n coefficients decrease with n. We would like to give the answer in the following manner. Suppose we take a f of t has finite discontinuities. Example, suppose I have a wave form like this, a square wave, familiar square wave. There is a jump here, there is a finite discontinuities. For such wave forms, it can be shown that for large m and a constant m, the Fourier coefficients for large n are constrained by a factor like this. So, as you take n to be large more and more, then the coefficients go down as 1 over m. That means the spectrum for this, suppose it is like this, the values of the various coefficients are constrained by 
a line like this m by n. On the other hand, suppose f of t is continuous but the derivative f prime t has discontinuity. That means the function itself is continuous, but then there is a discontinuity in its derivative. An example function like this will be like this. Suppose I have something like this. This is a periodic function, it is continuous, there is no jump anywhere. But if you take its derivative, the derivative here is the, like this, the derivative here will be negative. That means the derivative function of this will be something like this. So the derivative has a discontinuity, but the function itself is smooth. In this event, the variable Fourier coefficients go down as m by n squared. That means that they decrease as 1 over n squared. That means the decrease is faster than in this case because this is a smoother function than this. You can continue like this. Suppose you say the lowest order derivative, the lowest order derivative which is discontinuous. is k. That means first k minus 1 derivatives are continuous. The first time a derivative fails to be discontinuous is other k, then it can be shown that C n goes down as m over n times k plus n to the power of k plus 1. That means this is a much smoother function than the earlier one. Therefore, the decrease of C n coefficients will be much faster. As an example, Suppose you take cos square omega naught t. This is a very smooth function. All its derivatives are continuous. And the Fourier series expansion really is half plus one half of cos 2 omega naught t. So you have the DC term, you have the second harmonic term, all the other terms have 0. So you have really one DC term and one second harmonic term here. That means further terms are all 0. Because this particular function of time is very smooth, all its derivatives are continuous, therefore the Fourier series go down very fast and in fact they become 0 after n equals 2. So this is an example of very smooth function. That means in other words to say, so to say if the function is a smoother then the faster will be the rate of decrease of the CN coefficients. That is the summary of what we have discussed under this head. The third question that we would like to ask is what is the behavior of this function at a point of discontinuity? Let us say this f of t has a discontinuity at a point x. Now if you take the Fourier series and evaluate the value of f of t at f of x, it turns out that the series, the FC Fourier series converges to f of x plus plus f of x minus divided by 2. The limit of f of t as you approach x from this direction, this value is f of x minus. The value here is f of x plus. So depending upon how you approach x from the right or left, you get x minus or x plus. But the series will converge to midpoint between these two. This is the point to which the series will converge. In respect to of how you define f of x. So you may define f of x as some value not necessarily this, but as far as the series is concerned, it converges to this. Now let us look at this figure where we took the Fourier series 
for a square wave and we have taken up to the 49th term. Now, the series converges to 0 at this point which is the proper thing to do which is the average of the left limit and right limit. But you would also observe that there is a small amount of overshoot just before the jump and just after the jump. And this overshoot is referred to in literature as Gibbs phenomenon and the amount of overshoot is 9 percent of the total jump and this is something which will persist no matter to what order of harmonic you go to. We just discuss two additional properties of the Fourier series. Suppose we have a function f1 of t and its Fourier series is this with c n 1 as the coefficients. Now, if this function f of t is shifted in time, translated in time by a certain amount, let us say f1 t minus tau. So, it is the same function, but the origin is shifted. It is delayed by an amount equal to tau seconds. Then it can be shown that the corresponding Fourier series for this will be such that C n 2 is C n 1 multiplied by e to the power of minus J n omega naught tau, which immediately shows that the magnitude of C n 2 is the same as the magnitude of C n 1. However, the phase is different, the angle is different, which means that the magnitude, magnitude spectrum of f 1 of t and the magnitude spectrum of f 1 of t minus tau will be the same. The phase, however, is decreased by an amount proportional to the frequency. An example of this we have seen earlier when we took a square wave with the origin at two different places and you could express a square wave in terms of cosine functions or sine functions. So, this is an important property that the constitution of the various harmonic components, the proportions of the various harmonic components will not depend upon where you place the origin. A second property relates to, suppose you have a periodic function, you multiply by a sinusoid. Again, let f of t be the periodic function. And let this be the Fourier series for that. The spectrum for this this is C naught, C1, C2, C minus 1, C minus 2, etc. Now, what I would like to ask is if f of t is multiplied by cosine omega c t, then we can say this is after all cosine omega c t is e to the power of j omega c t plus e to the power of minus j omega c t divided by 2 and you multiply this by c n e to the power of j n omega naught t. The result is you get one expansion c n upon 2 e to the power of j n omega naught, I may as well write this omega c plus omega n omega naught, omega c plus n omega naught t plus another group of terms c n by 2 e to the power of minus j omega c minus n omega naught. So, you have frequencies omega c plus or plus n omega naught where n ranges of course from minus infinity to plus infinity and another set of terms frequencies omega c minus minus omega c minus n omega naught. So, in other words if you look at the spectrum here centered around omega c you have various harmonic components. This will be c naught but 2 
this is C1 upon 2, etc. And centered around minus omega C, you have a second set of components. This is again C0 upon 2. So, this portion corresponds to this and this portion corresponds to this. So, what it means is the spectrum gets divided into two parts. One part is shifted to omega c, another part is shifted to minus omega c. Instead of being centered around the origin, it is centered around plus omega c and minus omega c. This is done in communication and instrumentation. When you want the information content of a signal, instead of being centered around the DC value, you would like to be shifted to a more convenient frequency for purposes of instrumentation or communication. And in that context, this is said to be the carrier frequency because it carries the information content associated with the F of t. You can use this to construct, use this information as an example you can think of if you have a full wave rectified sine wave, you can think of this as the product of a sine term and a product of a square wave. Suppose you multiply these two out, you can get this. Therefore, to find the Fourier series for this, you can use this property and then find the Fourier series. I will leave this as an exercise for you. To sum up, we have discussed at length the various properties of Fourier series, how the series can be obtained, the characteristics of the series, and how it may be used to analyze circuits excited by periodic but non-sinusoidal waveforms. We derived analytical expressions for calculating the various harmonic components. This is a, a process which is referred to as harmonic analysis. If the function f of t is given in the form of analytical expression, we can carry out this harmonic analysis analytically in the way we have done in the various examples. However, if the function is available in a graphical form with no analytical expression on hand available to you, then we can use numerical methods. And uh, computers can also be used, software programs can be developed to give the various harmonic components once you have the waveform prescribed or it can even be captured by means of discrete data points uh, experimentally. We also have instruments available to do this harmonic analysis. There are two categories of instruments. One is called the harmonic analyzer, where you feed the signal to the harmonic analyzer and you tune it and get the amplitude or magnitude of each harmonic component one at a time and read it out on a, on a meter. The other class of instruments are known as spectrum analyzers, where if you feed the signal, you will find the entire magnitude spectrum displayed on a screen. This is called a spectrum analyzer. The ideas of Fourier series are the harmonic analysis of periodic signals can be carried over to signals which are not periodic. They are called aperiodic signals. And this is the subject which we'll take up next when we talk about the Fourier integral concept. With this, we conclude our discussion of the Fourier series. In the next presentation, I'll give you a set of examples as an exercise for you and also we'll also include a elaborated demonstration on some of the concepts we have discussed.